Tonight we're going to talk about hormones. And it's a very good topic because it's something that reverses disease, prevents disease, and is not dangerous. If it's done properly, it's extremely safe. Have been prescribing bioidentical hormones for 25 years. It might even be longer than that, but I wanted to make it look decent. 25 years. I was doing this in Philadelphia long ago. Hormones are very powerful. Some of you are probably on thyroid hormone, and that's usually given to people in microgram doses. A microgram is one millionth of one gram. 30 grams is one ounce. A gram's pretty small. A millionth of a gram is really small. And hormones that we use, sex hormones, even smaller. So testosterone is measured in nanograms per 100 cc's of blood. 100 cc's of blood is three ounces of blood. A nanogram is one billionth, one billionth of a gram. That's how it's measured. That's how it, it goes in your body, circulates as uh, 100 billionths of a gram or 200 billionths of a gram. And it's an effective chemical in the body. It's very powerful. Estradiol is measured in picograms per one cc of blood. A picogram is one thousandth of a nanogram, which means it's one trillionth of a gram. So these hormones are very, very powerful, very strong and very low levels in the bloodstream. Hormones have been around in replacement form for many, many years. And 30, 40 years ago, they were being given out sort of like water to menopausal women. And they were effective. They felt better. Doctors were giving them pretty routinely. Woman comes in, hot flashes, night sweats, can't sleep. Here, Premarin Provera. And they worked. And they work predictably for certain kinds of symptoms. So hot flashes, night sweats would go away within a few weeks, maybe days. Insomnia got better. Anxiety, depression, reduced libido that you see in menopause, that got better. Vaginal health was improved as in menopause, the vaginal tissues kind of get dry and they kind of get thin. It's difficult to have sex because it's painful. And hormones reverse that. Bone density goes up effectively with hormones, and you can prevent osteoporosis by giving hormones. The skin looks better. The skin is better. And women who are on them look more youthful. And urinary infections go down because the tissues down here are protected. These other things were presumed benefits of the hormones. People thought if I take the hormones, Premin and Provera, I won't get heart disease, I won't get strokes, and my brain will work better. That's what was considered. Then everything changes in, it'll change soon. There, 2002. Even the machine doesn't want to put this out. So there was a big trial, Women's Health Initiative, 2002. They followed 20, 30,000 women for years. And they found that the women who were getting these hormones had an increased risk of breast cancer, heart disease, stroke, dementia, and blood clots. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that put the kibosh on the hormones. The doctors saw this, which no doubt was put on the front page of every newspaper. Hormones will do these things to you. The doctors stopped prescribing them. And women were then having menopausal symptoms that weren't treated anymore because the doctors weren't giving out the hormones. And instead, what were ladies given? Antidepressant drugs. Now that's 2002. This is 2017. And this is the latest edition of my Bible of medicine. Cecil and Loeb. Medicine. It's just got 3,000 pages of anything you could possibly want to know in medicine. And in there, 
If you look up the treatment of menopause, they have a whole page for alternative treatments to hormones for women in menopause. And the major drugs that are on that page are Lexapro, Paxil, Pristique, and Gabapentin. And they're all psychiatric drugs. So you got hot flashes and you got night sweats, take Pristique. I'll write your prescription for it. That's in the current book, textbook of medicine. I found that pretty amazing. And these people who write this, they're the experts. These are like the smartest people, the people who know the most about the treatment of menopause. Well, the hormones that were used in that Women's Health Initiative study that came out with all the negative stuff were Premarin and Provera. And Premarin is pregnant, P-R-E, mares, M-A-R, urine, I-N. Pregnant, mares, urine. That's how they made the name Premarin. So that's where they get it from. The only problem with this beautiful picture is that women are not horses. Women are human beings. Yeah. And Premarin is a different hormone than what, from what women make. And Provera is progesterone synthetically made with a different chemical structure from bioidentical progesterone. And all the books come out and all, all the articles come out making the assumption that they're the same as human hormones. And they're not. They're not the same. If you look at the chemical structure of these items, you will see that they're not the same. So how is it that they can be the same? They're not the same. So Premarin and Provera can create those side effects, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Most doctors still think it's the same. You can still get Premarin. You can still get Provera. You can still find a doctor who will prescribe those for you. And this book, my textbook of medicine, was saying that there's no strong proof that there's any benefit of taking bioidentical hormones. They say that. They do. So that's the chemical structure of bioidentical testosterone, estradiol, and progesterone. And if you look at this a little bit, you'll see that biochemically, there's very little difference between those three. They look almost the same. And one of them is estrogen, and one of them is testosterone, which are not the same. They're totally different in the body. But the rings, it's the same number of rings, same hydroxyl groups in some of them. There's a minute change in a couple of spots that makes testosterone, testosterone, and estrogen, estrogen, or estradiol, estradiol, and progesterone, progesterone. But these are the bioidentical ones. So it's kind of foolish to me to say that Premarin is the same as estradiol. It is not the same. So that one article that came out is not the only article. It happens to be the article everybody has, every doctor has in his head, but that's not the only article. There's been many articles since then. So here's one that was done in France, and they had 3,000 women, still a pretty good number of women, and this came out also in 2002. And the women were using a bioidentical transdermal estradiol. And they were using a bioidentical progesterone. They weren't using permanent Provera, and there was no increase in breast cancer. So th these hormones, the bioidentical hormones, did not cause breast cancer in this study. Here's another one, 2008. 80,000 women followed for eight years, women taking estrogen with bioidentical progesterone, no increase in breast cancer risk compared with women taking nothing. Women in this study who took estrogen alone without the progesterone had a 1.29 fold increased risk of breast cancer. So there was a slight increase in breast cancer risk in those women in this study. And the women who were taking estrogen plus Provera, the artificial progesterone, 1.7 fold increased risk. And this is what's been shown repeatedly that, it's, that the Provera being an artificial progesterone increases breast cancer risk. That's been shown in several studies. So the type of progesterone that was used was the more important factor 
even than the type of estrogen used. Another thing on breast cancer that makes me think that hormones are not the reason women get breast cancer is that the incidence of breast cancer goes up after menopause. It doesn't go down. So 51 years old, woman's menopausal, her risk of breast cancer should go down because she doesn't have hormones anymore, right? Well, it doesn't go down, it goes up. And it goes up a lot. So a 60-year-old woman has a greater risk of breast cancer. This is on no hormones. Then a 50-year-old, a 70-year-old has a greater risk than a 60-year-old, and an 80-year-old has a greater risk than a 70-year-old. And if you follow these people along, the estrogen level is going down, down, down the whole time. It doesn't start to stop happening till a woman's 85, and I suppose there's other reasons for that. But 85 and older women have a lower risk of breast cancer, finally. We've seen women here with breast cancer, 87 years old, 90 years old, 99 years old, no hormones, they had breast cancer. Other factors that I think are really involved in breast cancer are being overweight, not exercising, and eating the wrong kind of diet, and getting toxins into your system. And that's in the books. It's shown in the books that these things influence immune status and increase breast cancer risk. Here's another one. 2012, estrogen may protect women from breast cancer. Maybe it does the opposite. 7,000 women, half treated with estrogen, half treated with placebo for six years, followed for six more years. Breast cancer occurred less often in women who took the estrogen and the, in the women who did get breast cancer, those who took hormones had less than half the risk of dying from breast cancer or dying from anything. So this one showed the opposite. And I guess the point here is that there's a lot of studies. And if you keep reading studies and keep reading studies and keep reading studies, you may become confused because you're going to find all the possible results. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't actually does the opposite of what the other study shows. And you got to look at these things kind of with uh, using a fine tooth comb. How was the study done? What exactly did they do? And even more important than that, what was their purpose? What were the researchers trying to show? Because a lot of times the finding of the study is what they wanted the finding to be. And that happens a lot in medicine, especially in studies that are sponsored by drug companies. They often get the results that they're looking to get and take someone who's impartial to get a different result from that same type of drug. So lifestyle factors that cause breast cancer, overweight, alcohol, more than two drinks a day, and the lack of exercise, well-known risk factors. Diets can help you not get breast cancer. So diets that are high in cruciferous vegetables, that's broccoli, Brussels sprouts, Cauliflower, I know you love these vegetables, right? I put them in my smoothie every morning so I don't get something bad. And there are supplements that help that. Vitamin D helps immune function. Curcumin helps immune function. Mushrooms do. And something called I3CDIM, it's a supplement that we use a lot to help women who have concerns about breast cancer or history of breast cancer or family history of breast cancer. Take this, it'll reduce your risk. How much will it reduce it? I don't know, because nobody's done a big study on it. But there are factors in there that should be protective. So those are those factors. Just to say it again, but they're important. Especially now, when the average American is overweight. And 70% of adult Americans have prediabetes. Not diabetes, but prediabetes. And there's about 25 million who have diabetes. And diabetes is an increased risk for breast cancer and other cancers. And there's this thing about blood clots, which came out of the birth control pill, because it's been well established that if you take the birth control pill, your risk of blood clots is going to go up. And blood clots can cause pulmonary embolism, and they can cause strokes, and they can cause heart attacks. And I've seen 25-year-old women on birth control pills get heart attacks from the pill. What happens is that the estrogen that they swallow in the birth control pill goes to the liver first and stimulates the liver to make clotting factors. And that sets them up for having blood clots in different places. It's a well-known risk factor 
of the birth control pill. What's in the birth control pill? Estrogen that's not bioidentical and progesterone that's not bioidentical and they're giving it by mouth so it goes to the liver and stimulates clotting factors. Wrong way to take hormones. Or if you're going to take the birth control pill, take something that will help you not get blood clots. We have a number of things for that. If you take transdermal estrogen, the creams you rub on your skin, there's no increased risk of blood clots. This is a, another study. And oral estrogen, as we just mentioned, will increase blood clots by three and a half times, taking it by mouth. Don't take it by mouth. There's one way you can do that, which we'll go over. Estrogen in heart disease. Heart disease in men begins at the age of 50 or sooner in women, it doesn't tend to start until they're 60 years old. And then it goes more rapidly forward in women than in men. This is thought to be an effect of losing estrogen. Estrogen maintains elasticity in arteries. And this has actually even been shown in men who decided to become women. And they took estrogen. And they measured their arterial elasticity, which increased by taking estrogen. So this is a well-known factor in men and women. Therefore, estrogen should be protective against heart disease, as long as it's not making you increase clotting factors. Another study on estrogen and heart disease. So they measured calcification in coronary arteries. Anyone here had a coronary artery study done with calcifications to see how much you have? I've had three of them. There's a CAT scan that goes across your heart, and it detects calcium in the coronary arteries, which is a marker for plaque that causes heart disease. So you can get this little test done fairly inexpensively. Medicare usually won't pay for it. But it gives you a calcium score. So if your calcium score is zero, you have no plaque that's been hardened. And your cardiac risk is probably zero. If your calcium score is 100, you have some risk. And if your calcium score is 1,000, you have a lot of risk. Last time I did mine, it was about 80, something like that. So this one was estrogen therapy measuring the same thing in 1,000 women. And after taking estrogen for 8.7 years, the calcium score in those ladies on the estrogen was 83, which is a pretty good score. And in the women who were taking placebo, no hormones, is 123. So there was a substantial change in coronary calcification related to not taking estrogen, which is protective. Estrogen and heart disease, more stuff. Hormone replacement therapy reduces the usual rise in blood pressure with age. The older you get, the higher your blood pressure goes. I'm, I, exp I expect some of you have experienced that. The systolic pressure goes up. The diastolic stays the same or goes down. These are indicators of stiff arteries. When your arteries get stiff, the blood pressure does it, goes that way. Systolic goes up, diastolic goes down. Systolic blood pressure went up 18.7 points in, in 10 years in women who took no hormones and only went up 7.6 in women who were on hormones. Substantial change in blood pressure going up in women who were not on hormones. And blood pressure is a major factor in heart disease. Carotid artery thickness, another way of assessing risk and women who were taking the estrogen had thinner carotid arteries than women who were not on estrogen. Just another marker that indicates development of heart disease. Diabetes, less common in, in women on hormone replacement than in women who are not on hormone replacement. There's another study on protection against brain aneurysms. I have a patient who had a, a stroke from a ruptured aneurysm in her brain. And about a year or two ago, we talked about this. I got this article and told her, you still have an aneurysm up there. If you take estrogen, your risk of that thing popping is going to be less. Well, she's been on hormones for two years, hasn't had any events. Hopefully, she never will. Hormones and brain function, that's one area that that particular study in 2002 said your brain's going to get worse, you're going to get more dementia. 
That was the artificial hormones. But here's another study, several studies. Depression got better with hormones. Insomnia got better. Self-esteem got better. All these things got better with hormones. In postmenopausal women, higher levels of free estrogen were associated with improved cognitive performance after six years. So estrogen helped the brain work better. Older women who used hormone replacement therapy for 10 years or more had a 40% reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease compared with women on no hormones. Telomeres, you know what telomeres are? Those are the parts of your chromosomes that protect them from damage, or ends of the chromosomes. As you get older, the telomeres get shorter. And the shorter they get, the greater is your risk of running into different kinds of trouble like liver disease, lung disease, bone marrow failure, and a few kinds of cancer. Testosterone lengthens telomeres. Some studies on telomeres have shown that testosterone is good for them, and so is estrogen. No question about bone density. Any hormone that you take, whether it's Premarin or whatever, any form of estrogen was going to raise bone density. That's been shown repeatedly. And we know that with bioidentical hormones, bone density goes up considerably. And we've had it. The pellets are the strongest way of taking hormones. We'll talk about pellets in a couple of minutes. But pellets provide a consistent level of hormones. If you take it, a, put a pellet under the skin, the hormone level is going to go up, and it's going to stay up for three months or more. And that consistent effect of estrogen or testosterone or whatever you're putting in the pellet gives a stronger effect on bone density. And I have seen bone density go up 15 to 20 percent in about three years in women receiving hormone pellets. I've seen reversal of osteoporosis many times. Pellets are the strongest way of doing that. What do women usually get when they get osteoporosis? You got a low bone density. Here's Prolia. Uh, here's uh, Fosamax. Here's Actinel. All of these drugs raise bone density at the price of destroying the bone in your mandible or maxilla. So if the dentist tries to pull out a tooth or do something else in there, it may not heal. And I've seen that several times. And it's painful and doesn't heal. We've been able to reverse that in a few people by injecting ozone into the area of the gum that wasn't getting better. But it's a risky deal to be on that drug. I had a lady a few months ago who was on Actinel, which is another one of those drugs that I gave her five years ago. She'd been on it all that time. And her bone density was going up, and then she broke her leg. All she was doing was walking. She didn't fall down. But this bone, the femur, broke. And she had to have surgery. And she couldn't take care of her dog for three months. And she had to pay, I don't know how many dollars, for someone else to take care of her dog. And she was in pain. So that's probably the last time I will ever give anybody Actinel or any of those drugs. I don't want to have that happen, and I know these things work. Hormone delivery systems. Well, this is one way you can take them by mouth and still be safe. There's one pharmacy that I know of in Colorado that makes something called BLA tablets. Biolymphatic absorption is BLA, which means that when you swallow the pill, it goes into the lymphatic system, and the lymphatic system dumps it into your bloodstream up here. It doesn't go to the liver first. There is no first-pass metabolism. There's no stimulation of the liver to make clotting factors. So you can take estrogen as a BLA tablet, and swallow it. So I have several women doing that. And you can do that with progesterone also. Progesterone doesn't increase clotting factors anyway, but if you give it as a BLA tablet, it stays in the bloodstream longer and it's a better, has a better effect on sleep. We use progesterone a lot to help women sleep. So major points. Don't use non-human identical hormones. Don't use Premarin. Don't use stuff that comes from horse's urine. And you can use progesterone, but only bioidentical. And the oral progesterone works better for sleep than the transdermal progesterone. So if there's a sleep issue, we give progesterone by mouth. 
Should you ever discontinue hormones? Big question, and I get that all the time. And different docs have different opinions, and there's zero research on that, really. Nobody knows how long you can take hormones for and still be good. But my answer is, why do you want to stop? Because nobody has shown that taking hormones for 20 or 30 years is going to have a worse outcome. And what I've seen repeatedly is when women stop taking hormones, they don't feel so good. They lose all of the benefits. Libido goes down, the skin doesn't look as good, vaginal dryness occurs, bone density goes down, and they can't think as well. I've seen lots of women who told me, and guys as well on testosterone, that they could think better. Their brains work better. I don't give them my Q tests. I go by what they say, and the people around them are telling them that they're better. So why would you want to stop that? And there's no evidence to show that you should stop. So I don't tell people to stop. I have 90-year-old people on hormones. Use hormone metabolic enhancers. This is for women on estrogen. If there's any concern about breast cancer, use that indole-3-carbinol. Take some immune protectors like vitamin D. Be on an organic diet. Specialize in vegetarian-type foods. Don't eat a lot of meat. Don't eat sausages. Don't eat poison. You know, the American regular old diet is kind of a poison diet. If a woman's had breast cancer, probably know uh, Suzanne Summers who had breast cancer and went right on hormones. I like to wait a year or two. A lot of times we have to deal with doctors who've been treating the breast cancer. We'll usually tell them, don't ever go on hormones. I insist that you never go on hormones because you've had breast cancer. Well, we kind of work around that a little bit. Sometimes the doctor will change his mind and say, after a few years, you can be on hormones. I like to see ladies free of breast cancer for at least a couple years, one or two years. Then we work with hormones. And I use the lowest dose that provides benefit for them. I don't give them big doses. One physician, Dr. Glazer, put some articles out a couple years ago, and she treated over 1,000 women and followed them up for five years. And she treated most of them with testosterone. Testosterone has, gives you similar effects as estrogen in ladies. It can increase bone density, increase libido, make you feel better, all the kinds of things. And it partially works by turning into estrogen. So if you have testosterone in your body, it'll go to the fat cells, and the fat cells will convert testosterone into estrogen. It happens in men, it happens in women. So if you take testosterone, estrogen is going to go up. But what she found was that the incidence of breast cancer in the women who were treated with testosterone was only half the incidence as it was in women who took no hormones at all. So testosterone in her group actually reduced the incidence of breast cancer. She had one patient, a 90-year-old person, who had breast cancer didn't want any treatment, maybe she was too sick for it or whatever, and the doctor actually put testosterone implants into the breast that had breast cancer and the cancer shrunk. She put that in one of her articles. Interesting. This is transdermal estrogen. You can put progesterone in there, you can put testosterone in it, it's just a cream. And you rub it on every day. In women who are newly menopausal with lots of symptoms, I tell them twice a day. Do it in the morning, do it in the evening, because what's going to happen is the cream's going to raise the level and it's going to come down again in a few hours, and then you can have symptoms again. So if you take it twice a day, break the dose up, it works better. In women who have, are postmenopausal by a few years, it doesn't seem to matter. I tell them, use it once a day, it's fine, and it's fine. A lot of times we use estriol. Estriol is another estrogen that in some Research has been protective against breast cancer, so a lot of times we use estriol with the estradiol. Estriol itself by itself doesn't do that much. Although I use estriol in a facial cream that's really good for ladies' skins. So it makes your face look younger. And the wrinkles get a little smaller. Progesterone you can take through the skin, you can take it by mouth. If the uterus is still there, you have to take it. Because estrogen alone will stimulate the uterus and increase the risk of uterine cancer. That's true. 
So if a woman has a uterus, we always use progesterone along with the estrogen, and then there's no increase in risk. And oral progesterone is better for sleep than transdermal. You can add testosterone. It does increase libido. Got to be careful with testosterone because if you put it on the skin where there can be hair growth, it can grow hair. So some women putting it over here, they can grow hair on their arms, for instance. So what I do a lot of times is I say, if you put it over here on the wrist, there's no hair follicles there. You can't grow hair on the wrist. So they just put it there, and that works fine. Vaginal dryness sometimes is still there, even with the hormones. So you can use estriol or estradiol vaginally a couple times a week, increases the moisture in the vagina and helps with a lot of symptoms. Hormone pellets. Not a lot of people put pellets in. But we do, and I've been doing it for about a dozen years. And my wife talked me into it. She said, what about these pellets? Why don't you get into pellets? I said, well, I'm using creams, and I'm using pills, and we're doing all this stuff. I don't, we don't need pellets. And she says, you ought to do pellets. So we started doing pellets, and she might have been the first patient, my wife. But she's still getting pellets 12 years later. Because nothing is as good as the pellets. And she's told me that many times. She said, I'll never take anything except those pellets. So she says, come over here, and we put a little lidocaine under the skin and wait a few minutes till the skin is numb, and you make a tiny little cut with a blade, about three millimeters, and you put a little trocar, which is a metal tube, into that little cut, and you slide the pellets in through the trocar into the fat just beneath the skin. And the pellets will sit there for the next three or six or nine months, gradually reduce releasing hormones, estrogen and testosterone. Progesterone, you can't put into a pellet because the pellet would be too big. These are tiny little things. Remember what I said about hormone dosages being very powerful in a very small amount. So the estradiol that goes into the pellet is six milligrams or 10 milligrams or 15, very tiny pellet. Testosterone a little bit bigger, not very much. It stays there. We don't get extrusions. We don't get infections. We don't get bleeding. You don't have to put a stitch in. You don't have to glue it shut. It closes over. The only thing is you can't go into the ocean for five days or, or take a bath. You've got to wait five days. After that, it's closed over. You can do anything you want. Can you take a shower? Yes. No scar? It leaves a mark. It's not, I don't know if I can call it a scar. It's, it's a little white mark. How long what? How long will it disappear? Well, always there. The mark? The yeah. The pellet. The oh, the pellet is, is gone in three to six months. You can't feel it in there. So it dissolves itself? It dissolves all by itself, yeah. Oh. Yeah. And what happens is the blood circulating through that area is absorbing the estrogen and testosterone in the pellet and putting it into the circulation. And I tell people, your, your levels are going to be up before you leave the office. Within 10 minutes, the blood levels are up because I've tested it. But they don't feel it for five to seven days. And then they feel it. And it stays that way because the hormone levels don't change in the bloodstream. Same daytime, same nighttime, weekends, whatever. It's the same level. doesn't change. So you have a consistent level of hormones for the first time in your life. Right here, in the, butt. in the butt, not where you sit. You don't sit on them, right back here. Then most people have enough fat in there to, everybody does. It works, yes. No, the, the first time you introduce that into somebody, how do you know how much to introduce? Because there are different body densities and yeah. sizes. And yeah, so you go by the person's age, the person's weight, and the person's symptoms. So like we put pellets into a lady today, first time. She had a hysterectomy. She was like 39 years old. She had a hysterectomy for some medical reason, and her ovaries were removed as well, and she weighed 190 pounds. So putting all of those things together and the fact that she was having a lot of symptoms, we figured out an estradiol dose of 15 milligrams and a, and a testosterone dose of 50 milligrams. So it's a clinical estimate. That's how you know what to put in. 
And I usually will put in a slightly lower dose than I might otherwise put in just to start with something because you can't take pellets out. Once they're in, they're in. So I go with a little bit of a lower dose than I might put in later on and see what happens with them. Then they come in three or four or five months later for the next pellets and we measure blood levels to see where they are and we go by their symptoms. So the next time she comes in, she might get 20 milligrams or 25 or something like that. Or if her breasts get tender, then we'll go with a lower dose because that's the thing I follow for too much estrogen. But it's not dangerous. It really depends on how they feel. So I put some, yeah. About the hot flashes, if the woman, the patient had hot flashes, would, would this help? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yes? You get rid of them. You get rid of hot flashes. Even somebody with very, very, very bad hot flashes? Hot flashes are estrogen deficiency. Unless there's some other disease going on, it's an estrogen deficiency. You give them estrogen, the flashes go away. Go away. So you do not measure the level of hormones before you... I do to a degree. I mean, if a woman is menopausal, her estrogen level is going to be down here. And her testosterone level is going to be here or here or here. That doesn't change that much because testosterone is produced in the adrenal glands. So the levels usually stay about the same before and after menopause. So we go by symptoms, but I usually measure a testosterone level and an FSH level before I put in the first pellets. The FSH is a pituitary hormone that goes up with menopause. When the estrogen goes down, the pituitary says, we got to make estrogen, so it raises the FSH level follicle stimulating hormone, but the ovaries aren't working. So the hormone level is not going to go up, but the FSH stays up until you put in your hormones. And I'll use that number to see how effective the pellets are. So the FSH in menopause is usually 100 to 150. After you put the pellets in, it's going to come down to 50 or 40 or 20 or 5. The more the stronger the dose, the long as you put them in long enough, the, the level of FSH goes way down. And I'll follow that to see what's going on. So it's a way of making a clinical measurement. But the main thing is, how's the person doing? And if I see symptoms of, you know, this, that, or the other, vaginal dryness, no libido, raise the hormones. And if they get breast tenderness or they get too horny, Lower the hormones, because that's happened too. One of the things about hormones is if you've got a husband and a wife, a person and a partner, you don't want to have one up here and the other one down here, because it's not going to go very well. So you want to kind of work to have the two of them at the same level. That's what we do. I always ask, because you don't want to create problems in a marriage <laughs> with hormones, because that can happen. So that's the pellets. And that's what they look like. You see how small those things are. This one is a testosterone pellet. The estrogen is the smaller one in that person's palm. They're really small. Still need progesterone. Take it by mouth. Here's a lady, 60 years old, osteoporosis, terrible bone density. Pellets for three years, bone density went up 20%. Bone density normal. Osteoporosis is gone. Seen that many times. 58-year-old woman, no sex life, restored by pellets, and she said, and she, she wrote this down, it has saved my marriage and it has changed my life. A woman whose marriage was not doing well because she had no desire or ability to have sex until she got the pellets. It can be really important. Here's another lady, 88 years old, one year on pellets. Husband was 15 years younger, believe it. Looks great, she's a very nice looking lady. And she said, this is the best sex I've had in my life. I heard her say it. What about guys? What do we do for guys? Well, one thing to know is that testosterone does not cause prostate cancer. It does not cause prostate cancer. It can grow prostate cancer if you have it, but there's more to it than that, which we'll go over. But testosterone goes down past the age of 40. It goes down 1% per year. It's not like menopause. Menopause, estradiol is like this, and then it's like this. Bingo. Testosterone is different. 1% per year. In 20 years, it's down 20%. In some guys, it goes down faster than that. 
What happens to a guy with low testosterone, even a woman with low testosterone? Fatigue, irritability, depression, trouble concentrating and making decisions, low libido, low sexual performance, and obesity. Testosterone reduces abdominal fat. Cardiac risk. You might have seen some articles in the last year or two. It was in the newspapers. Some people did some research, blah, blah, that said testosterone increased cardiac risk. And there were a whole bunch of articles, letters that came in from angry doctors saying, I've been using it for 20 years. We don't see heart disease with testosterone. It's not true. And subsequently, there was another article put out by someone, some people who did a lot of research on this said there's no evidence that testosterone increases cardiac risk. The first article was wrong, period. So here's other articles on testosterone saying lower testosterone levels in older men is associated with earlier death. Doesn't say what they die of, it just says they're dead. Men with testosterone levels under 241, I don't know why they picked that number, but that's a low level. 40% more likely to die than those with higher levels over 12 years. Die of anything. Because low testosterone reduces your stamina, reduces your ability to do things, reduces your ability to move, to do exercise, and you become like this, and those people die sooner. Cardiac risk in people with low testosterone increased 38% and respiratory risk increased 129%. What does testosterone do for breathing? It strengthens your respiratory muscles. You can breathe deeper or if it increases your athletic performance and you can do more athletics, you can breathe more and you can breathe better. All goes along with a sedentary lifestyle not being associated with longevity. The more you do, the longer you live. You know, as long as you don't try to walk across uh, World Trade Centers on a, on a tight wire, you know, that's not a good idea. What about that tennis player that ate healthy and right on the racket court, he had a heart attack. He was athletic, he re regularly exercised, he ate organic, mm -hmm. and he dropped dead of a heart attack. Yeah, well the studies have shown and this has happened repeatedly in guys running a marathon or drop dead on the marathon thing, that while you're exercising, if you're doing it vigorously, like a tennis, professional tennis player might, your risk of dying goes up. But your risk of dying when you're not exercising goes down. So if the tennis player had lived through that match, <laughs> his risk of dying would be lower. When you're in shape, your risk of death goes down. But you have to be careful about what you do. I don't recommend 70-year-old guys to go out and run marathons. I think it's a really bad idea. I think in a lot of those uh, cases, when they do a um, autopsy, they find that there's an enlarged heart or there are other preconditions. Yeah, that's right. That yeah. Professional, yeah, in, in all sports. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's high, true. High school basketball players. Yeah, that's true, right. They're dying of other kinds of cardiac conditions, but there was a very famous... Uh, uh, basketball player from Louisiana. What was his name? He was all pro, all everything. He's in the Hall of Fame. Maravich. Yeah, very good. And he was like the best around. And he dropped dead after he had retired. He was in his 40s, I think, like 42 or something. He dropped dead playing uh, basketball on the court. And they did an autopsy on him and found that he had been born without one of the major coronary arteries. So he was living on two instead of three coronary arteries his entire professional life and did okay until he hit 40 something or other and then his, his heart gave out because it had been getting deprived of blood and oxygen his, all those years. Interesting, interesting story. That's not unusual at all. All right, testosterone replacement in guys, anything less than 300 is low, it's an arbitrary number. There have been studies that have been done, groups of doctors and the chronologists sitting around and deciding when can you give a guy testosterone and they came up with the conclusion anytime. Don't go by the number, go by the symptoms. But how do you test uh, blood level? Problems, 
you can, you can take blood and measure testosterone level. Testosterones fluctuate. You really want to measure it in the morning, although we measure it any time because you can't always do it that way. But it fluctuates about 10% in the course of a day. So if a guy is at his peak 400, he might be as low as 360 or something, somewhere else in the daytime. But you get a pretty good idea from blood levels what to do. And we will measure the PSA, which comes from the prostate, about three months after we start testosterone therapy. We measure the blood count because testosterone raises blood count. It can make it go too high. I've had a lot of guys, not a lot, but a number, that we had them give blood because their blood count went too high, which can increase the risk of having clots. So I just say, give some blood to the Red Cross, and that's it. If a guy has prostate cancer, you got to treat the cancer and get rid of it before you give testosterone. Most people will agree with that. Many men receiving surgery or radiation for prostate cancer will have low testosterone because the radiation is going here as well. And it will knock off the testicles so they can't make testosterone. So you want to see what's going on with that. We monitor the PSA always. Remember that testosterone will also go down with stress. And it's, it's commonly occurring when a guy has, if a guy has an operation or he gets hit by a car or something like that, his testosterone level goes way down and it can stay down for months or years. Testosterone responds readily to stress. It goes right down. Doesn't like stress. Then you have the question about testosterone replacement in a guy who has prostate cancer. I have a patient now and we're in the process of negotiating because this guy knows that prostate cancer will respond to Lupron, which blocks testosterone, for a number of years. But then the cancer becomes resistant and it will grow anyway. And he doesn't want that to happen to him. So he dug up these other articles from these other experts and said to me, I want to go on testosterone after my PSA goes down to a certain point because I want to prevent those prostate cancer cells from taking off years from now. And the idea is, is that if you give testosterone intermittently to someone you're treating for prostate cancer, you may be able to block the growth of resistant cells and the person will always be able to be treated. This is kind of theoretical, but the point is really well taken because I've seen it many times. After five years or 10 years or something like that, you can give Lupron and knock down testosterone and the cancer grows anyway. It's not working anymore. It's an important point. So we'll see what happens with this fellow. I'll be interested. Okay, follow the estrogen level. Testosterone will raise estrogen levels. It gets converted into fat cells to estrogen, so we always monitor that. And if the estrogen level in a guy goes up past 50 or 60, we'll give him something to block the conversion, which is an astrazole, which is a medication. We actually put it in the pellets, so it's already in there, and it prevents conversion to estrogen. Testosterone can be given as a shot, which hurts a little bit. That's usually once a week. It can be given as a transdermal cream, it can be given as a tablet, it can be put under the tongue, and it can be a pellet. Highest blood levels last about four months and uh, pretty dramatic effect. I have a little comment from someone, but this is a guy, I just saw him today. He's been getting pellets from me for uh, about a year or two. And he came in all excited about how well he was doing. 55-year-old guy has been getting pellets put into his butt for a couple of years. And he says, the quality of my life has greatly improved since I started seeing Dr. Sassen because he got pellets. I own a business which provides care for people with special needs. My level of involvement and activity is extremely high. My treatments at the Institute for Progressive Medicine have brought back the energy and well-being I am accustomed to and need to do my job as best as possible. That's how he wrote it. Recently, I traveled with my clients and felt incredible 
as I led all of our activities. It was obvious that the whole group benefited from this. My family and friends have noticed a positive change in me overall. And this guy comes in and he's like bouncing around. He's like great. He's like got all the energy of a 20 year old. That's what he said. And it's pretty amazing. And he did not have that before he started getting the pellets. His testosterone level back then was kind of low. He was around 50 or 100. He was really low. I don't remember why that was. But the pellets picked him up really to a level of over 1,000. It was way up there. We just have to monitor his PSA, which is fine. And we have to monitor his blood count, which is fine. And he can continue with this indefinitely, in my opinion, because it's made him really good. There's other ways of taking testosterone. You can take uh, clomiphene, which is a tablet that stimulates the testicles to make testosterone. In most guys, low testosterone is an effect of reduced pituitary function, which has an effect of reducing testicular function. So clomiphene stimulates that. So I have several guys, it doesn't always work, but you take a pill a couple days a week and it can raise testosterone levels a couple hundred points. It will not raise it as much as the pellets will. 54 year old guy, low energy, low libido, labs show low normal thyroid. Interesting case because he was normal in his measurements according to the usual criteria. So his thyroid number was normal, his testosterone level was normal, but he had low libido and he had low energy and he was a little depressed. So what are you supposed to do? Would I give him Prozac? Would I give him Pristique? Would I give him what's in those books? So we gave him a little bit of testosterone and a little bit of thyroid, and then the dose was raised a little bit. Marked improvement in energy, marked improvement in libido. Basically, he became normal. So what we did was take a guy who was normal and made him more normal, such that his symptoms disappeared with hormones. And a lot of doctors will not treat with hormones if your numbers are normal, in quotes. I have a lot of patients on thyroid hormone who came in with fatigue. Then they go on to doctors and the doctors wanted, didn't want to give them anything because their numbers are normal, you don't need anything. And when we gave them thyroid hormone, a quarter grain, half a grain, whatever it was, you can give low dose, they felt better. So why not use it? No side effects in low dose. And the same thing with, with hormones. The lady comes in and she has all the symptoms of low hormones and she's postmenopausal, I will give her hormones and she will respond. They almost always do. So bottom line, see how you feel with hormones. Hormones will improve your bone density, your mood, your sleep, your skin quality, your sense of well-being, libido, vaginal health, energy, cognitive function, and it may lower the risk of heart disease, stroke, and dementia. I'm pretty sure that whenever the real studies come out in a few years, they will show that because people are doing so much better with activity levels and just the idea of being able to do more and exercise more and keep your weight down should have the effect of reducing mortality. It has to, we already know that. So why not do something that allows that to occur? Uh, just another comment, there's another subject, something that's uh, close to my heart that's a little different. And uh, we can talk about hormones in a minute. I just wanted to show you this. We do ultrasound and we give injections to people who have problems with joints, muscles, tendons, ligaments, that kind of stuff. And you can see the problems with the ultrasound. You can tell by examination also, but you can see it on ultrasound. And you can do injections with prolotherapy and with ozone and sometimes with stem cells, which is a stronger treatment into the areas that are damaged that you can see on the ultrasound. So this is actually my wife who does Latin dance. So she, she dances really hard. And she tore her meniscus, medial meniscus in her left leg about five or six months ago. And then she could hardly walk, let alone dance, which was a catastrophe. So we started doing prolotherapy and giving her ozone injections and she got a little better, but not better enough. And then we did um, some stem cell injections into that torn meniscus and surrounding areas. And I don't know how much you can see here, and you may not see it, but this is an older film from the ultrasound. And these little black areas right in the middle of that meniscus 
That's between the bones and the knee on the inside. There's a tear in there, a pretty big tear. So that's what was causing her trouble. And a few weeks ago, I don't think you can tell on that, the tear was gone. M most importantly, she has no pain. So she can dance for three hours now. She's fully normal again as a consequence of that. If she'd gone to an orthopedic surgeon, he would have wanted to operate on her, take out that torn meniscus, and then go about your business. Well, you don't recover from a surgical procedure on a meniscus for several months, and then you don't know what you're going to have left because they always take tissue out and that leaves you with something less than a full joint. She has her entire working joint back again. And in fact, we did ultrasound on both of her knees last week, and you can see that the meniscus on the bad side that had been torn was a healthier looking meniscus than on the good side, which has nothing wrong with it yet. So then the question comes, you know, should we start doing injections on the good knee to keep that meniscus from rupturing next week? So. We'll have to figure that one out, but that's what she's saying. She wants to dance forever, and it might keep her dancing by giving her stem cell injections in areas that may break down in the future. So we work at all those things. We inject shoulders and backs and knees and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't always work 100% of the time, but it works a high percentage of the time, and you can prevent surgical interventions that may not solve the problem. And I've seen that happen also many times, especially in back surgery, which is very problematic unless you're dealing with something very specific. So something to, if you have any questions about this, you know, come in the office, talk to me, whatever. But we do a lot of these injections. We have a lot of good results. So thank you very much and uh, appreciate your coming. Anybody has any questions, I'll be here for a little while.